Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bipolar Awakenings podcast with me, Sean Blackwell. And today I'm going to be talking to Robin Timmers. Robin is an experienced expert from the Netherlands. Ten years ago, he founded the first Hearing Voices Support Center, and there he developed a recovery and emancipation-oriented approach to learning to live with hearing voices, as opposed to just ignoring them or blocking them. His broad interests include recovery, spirituality, and human rights. I've met Robin at conferences both in the Netherlands and here in Brazil, so I thought he'd be the perfect guy to talk to about this very interesting and misunderstood subject. So, Robin, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. And so why don't we just start off by getting into your story. You're a voice hearer. How did that all start for you? If you just want to give us a quick yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Um, I first started hearing voice when I was 25. I was studying psychology and had an interest in brain research and consciousness. The eternal question of consciousness. Mm. And uh, I developed an interest in spirituality as well. I was reading Carlos Castaneda, listening to Toll, reading Carl Jung, stuff like that. And I regularly smoked weed and sometimes tried something else. And this... Uh, what was that something else? That Come something on. else <laughs> was, <laughs> was an LSD trip in, uh, in a village, okay. a squatted village in the Netherlands. It's kind right. of Burning Man kind of uh, festival. And there I started hearing voices for the first time and saw visions and it was quite intense. And the, the first time I started hearing voices, actually I was thinking about my mom. Uh, she passed away when I was four years old. She right. had a hemorrhage a couple of years before that. And uh, then she got mental problems. and got hospitalized with bipolar <laughs> um, um, diagnosis. And I think it's an understandable reaction to what happened to her because she was a beautiful, young, intelligent, uh, kind woman uh, who all of a sudden lost all her roles in life, you know? Um, um, yeah, and she, she eventually uh, committed suicide when I was four. And I was thinking about Terrible. that because I, I felt like a uh, a substream in my uh, consciousness, like, hey, there's something there. What is it? And then I heard a voice. I was thinking, do I, did I have any role in her decision? And then I heard a female voice that said, but you didn't kill her. And that was a kind of friendly voice, but I wouldn't think of thinking in terms of killing my mother or something. And it was a female voice. It was definitely not a, a thought or a memory or imagination was happening live in my head at the time. So that was at the, the time you, you had the uh, LSD experience that happened. Yeah. And also what happened there, um, because spirituality is a central topic in your podcast. Um, I, I got into a trance, uh, in prayer position like this for hours. And I started seeing visions, of a big white temple going a mile high in the sky. And I never prayed oh. before that. And that, that just spontaneously happened. And for me, it was like my whole worldview was turned upside down. Hey, there is a spiritual reality out there that I didn't know of. And yeah, and normally the trip, yeah, after a day you're, you're sober again and kind of normal, uh, conscious states, uh, but it didn't stop for me. I, I kept seeing and hearing and feeling things I wasn't used to. So I tried to go on with my study and my work and life in general. But uh, after a while, these voices became more negative and I became more afraid of them. And they start talking about stuff that I would lose my soul. And I got into a very big panic, uh, like existential panic, you know, um, oh. and into a psychological crisis or maybe a spiritual crisis. But um, when I returned from that, you know, the doctors say you have uh, psychosis, here's antipsychotics. <laughs> I tried to live um, for a year to pick up my life, but all these experiences, they, they were, yeah, I, I, on the one hand, I was afraid of them, but on the other hand, I thought there's something here that I need to figure out. It's kind of important, you know? 
Um, so this year was like really up and downs and really low, like suicidal kind of uh, uh, times, but also sometimes with yeah, inspiration and beautiful uh, experiences. Meanwhile, trying to work, but it didn't work out quite. And eventually I got hospitalized. First time it was voluntarily, I could go back home after a week. Second time I wanted to go home, they say, no, we're afraid you're going to be homeless and we're going to lock you up. So I was locked up for a year and had forced medication and a year. isolation cell. Yeah, it's a long time, you know, where you, you are cut off from all your, the, the sources of um, support and inspiration that, that you actually need for your recovery. and. Back then, it was like you have schizophrenia. You're, you have a lifelong brain disease. You have to take this medication uh, with awful side effects for the rest of your life. And we don't take anything serious that you tell us about your experiences, you know, yeah, and about yeah. the spiritual stuff I was wrestling with. And um, so, yeah, it was like, uh, I don't know the English word, but we, we, uh, it was me against them and them against me, and we didn't get that much further. Uh, then, let me let, let me know. ask you something. Um, what type of clinic were you in? Was it like a residential center where you're with other people well, with disorders, or were you in the yeah. hospital? It's like a mental hospital in the Netherlands, so it's specialized uh, for uh, psychiatric, and it's like a crisis kind of department. Um, yeah, so all kinds and, of people and, and, in the crisis they come there. Yeah. Wow, and you were sleeping there every night for a year eating in the cafeteria there for a year. Yeah, and, and back then we uh, we were like with three or four people in one room, so no privacy, you know? Yeah. Wow. And um, yeah. Sounds like a pretty tough experience. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, uh, there was this kind of uh, judgment, and not only that I am ill and not to be taken serious, but also like um, a second rate uh, citizen or something, you know, that. I was like, um, how do you call this, an, an outlaw or something, you know, besides mm -hmm. society. Um, and actually in that time, I did a lot of uh, experimentation mentally and spiritually in trying to understand and cope with things. But also it was like a, a spiritual development going on um, in, the, in the isolation. So I got really inspired, you know, uh, and I, I found my values in life that I still use every day. Uh, universal love, that kind of thing. Um, so in the meanwhile, these things were happening as well. Um, and just uh, going back, going yeah. back in your experience, um, you, you said, so this started with this pretty much this LSD trip at this event. Mm -hmm. And you had, you said you'd never been religious before that you'd never attended church, never. No, uh, or my parents were uh, a religious, you know, and um, I had an anti religious. Interest. No, um, they were the first generation in the Netherlands that kind of um, got away from the church, you know. Uh, so I never was baptized. My brother still was, but me not, and I uh, never went to church. Later on, uh, we, we moved and I came to uh, Catholic school and they prayed there and I didn't need had to pray, but I was kind of interested. Hey, what is this? And I, well, I talked to the priest there and it was kind of funny because I knew a lot more about the Bible than this people at the Catholic school, we, we had lessons about the Bible at the general school uh, and was really interested in the parables, you know, in the mm -hmm. Bible. Wait, when did you attend yeah. Catholic school? When I was like 10 years, 10, 10 till uh, 9 till 12, we moved. Okay, so I'm confused from, about something so, though. Yeah. I'm confused about something. So your parents, you said were anti-religious? A religious, so they didn't uh, do anything with religion. And I went to a public uh, school, but we moved away from where all these things happened with my mother as well. You know, kind of starting a new life, and and the nearest school was a Catholic one. And so I guess that's where I went. Okay, uh, and so you of... were you were introduced to the Catholic religion, yeah. not because you were seeking the Catholic religion, just because the Catholic school was down the street. Yeah. Yeah. And so then you got interested in that stuff. And this is high school we're talking? No, this is uh, still uh, primary school. But primary it, school. I wasn't really that much doing with it um, later on. I got more interested 
when I was a teenager uh, in, uh, for instance, Buddhism, shamanism, and um, yeah, things like that. But uh, I was educated or, or brought up uh, kind of free, you know, you can find your own way in life. And, uh, right, okay. Yeah. Okay. So you had, even though you weren't religious before your LSD experience, you had an interest in spirituality. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. And then do you think your interest in and in studies in Buddhism, for example, maybe um, did they influence your LSD experience? You think? Yeah, I, I kind of think so. You know, the things, uh, like I told you, these influences, I was listening a lot to Tool. They just released Naturalis and they were singing about all kinds of esoteric stuff. So I was kind of researching that. Tool, um, the rock band, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, in the meantime, I was also researching Buddhism and Tibetan Book of the Dead, like Timothy Leary, you know, with LSD trip. <laughs> mm. So, and then reading Carlos Castaneda about uh, both one and uh, Nagolism. And, yeah, I was interested, but it was kind of uh, more distant interest, like, hey, there may be a world but far away from me or something. But after this trip, it was like my everyday life. And I didn't know I was thrown into the deep waters while I couldn't swim yet spiritually. So I, right, right. it took like, uh, yeah, five years or, or so to, to learn how to swim and navigate these waters. And so how did you learn how to swim? Good question. Yeah. Um, lots of things helped, but, uh, there was a, and, um, after these closed, uh, admissions or closed wards, I had a little bit of time homeless and then there was an, uh, my final uh, admission to hospital was a voluntarily one. And in that year, I consciously tried to live with these voices, was looking for ways to cope with these voices. And actually, there was a, a really nice conversation I had back when I was you know, in a closed ward with a, a nurse who was just having a conversation with me, a friendly conversation, not like a treatment program, but hey, Robin, how are you doing? And I was saying, I hear all these voices. And uh, and the, vo yeah. the voices were difficult at that point. Like you had that yeah. nice voice in the beginning related to your mother, but then after that, they were difficult. What would they say to you, the voices, for example, or recurrent? All things? kinds of nasty things. Yeah. And then there were all kinds of themes. Uh, there was it's a an lot adult of... show. You can tell us. Yeah. 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 Now, for, with hearing voices, it's um, the, these experiences can differ among people. And for me, it started hearing voices inside my head and later also from outside and mostly of people I don't know. Sometimes mm -hmm. voices I recognize as voices of people I know, but mostly unknown. Uh, unknown. So that, and what their meaning was, was kind of a question mark. And because I was afraid of them, I filled those question marks with very like um, there must be some kind of evil spirits or something. Mm. They, they, they talked about all kinds of things. Uh, for me, some people hear the same voice, they saying the same things every time. And for me, it was really change, uh, changing all the time what they were saying. Um, and sometimes when they were nasty, they were talking like things of death and devil or demon shit or whatever, okay. uh, or conspiracy stuff. You know, um, okay. uh, but sometimes they were friendly and they were like uh, soothing or I had some really beautiful experiences with music coming from out of nowhere, which <laughs> mm -hmm. were really nice. Um, and sometimes, yeah, voices of people I know. And actually it took maybe 10 years to, to understand some voices I heard back then because uh, voices can talk really like metaphorically, symbolically, like in dreams, you know, dreams are very sure. symbolic in nature, but then, and, as, and a lot of voice hearers have experienced that in the beginning, you take everything literal, what they say, and you get very afraid. They might be very powerful beings. They, they, they know things and they can do things that you don't know or can mm. do, you know? Mm -hmm. So there was in the beginning, um, I, I took it pretty much literal and uh, there was a lot of confusion and uh, a lot of paranoia. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But then, then let so, me tell this story with yeah. this guy. No, it's, go it's, ahead. Yeah. It's a good story. 
because it's interconnected with the spiritual thing. Uh, yeah. So he, he asked me, hey, Robin, how are you doing? And I said, like, I'm not feeling well. I got his voices. They're really nasty. And he asked me, but what are they saying? And they never asked me that, you know? Uh, they just, and who, could you, we, we went on a tangent. Who's the guy you're talking about? Again? A, a nurse on the closed ward. Nurse uh, on the closed ward. She, he started asking you yeah. about your voices. Yeah, and that wasn't normal. It was just uh, for the doctor something to check on the checklist and you have a symptom, you know. But <laughs> he was just having a person to person conversation with me. And right. He asked me, uh, so I listened what the voice said and I told him they're saying this. And he asked, can you, can't you say something back? And I said, I don't know how. I, I've, you know, I've talked out loud and screamed to those voices, but I didn't know to, how to talk to them inside my head. And I remember laying in my bed at night, that night, uh, trying to find my own inner voice, and I couldn't find it. It was just one direction from the voices to me. Right. Now, uh, like I was saying, in that time, I was uh, experimenting with all kinds of spiritual stuff, and I, I also started praying a lot. And this, kind of, this helped me to find hope and to uh, trust that there are solutions to the problems and that I don't know about, but that things can be okay, you know, and that there's some support from the spiritual good guys and coping with the <laughs> spiritual bad guys. <laughs> All right. But in doing that a lot, in praying a lot, you, you are actually talking inside. And I, I discovered uh, this last admission, this voluntarily admission, hey, I, I developed my own inner voice and I can say something back to those voices. It can be two direction mm -hmm. and... I can tell them what I think and what I need and what I want. And uh, I can, if they say something negative, I can put something positive uh, to balance that out, you know, or I can be assertive. Um, and it wasn't really a conversation yet and a dialogue of equals, but it was two direction. And I also uh, experienced that I could block those voices out if I use my own inner voice, you know, and I started also uh talking to myself and um if i was afraid to to calm me down and soothe me or uh, to um, give a pep talk to myself or to cheer myself up inside you know i've been my mm. own best friend and that's one of the most important things in my recovery i think to change the relationship with yourself and yeah be your own best friend you know and i did it quite literally with talking to myself inside um and also it gave me more grip on my head to speak out my thoughts inside and make my own decisions again, my own, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, opinions and, um, you know, so it gave me more grip on my, my head and by doing so more grip on my life, you know, mm -hmm. so this, this was one year of really doing that and also, um, try to, um, uh, recover from the traumas I have experienced with the voices and then also in psychiatry and calming myself down and acknowledging it to myself and the, telling myself it's understandable. So it's a kind of self therapy or something, but that's what, yeah, that's, uh, that's what happened. And when I, when I, um, overcome or learned how to live with these voices, that was really big obstacle out of the way. And I could start thinking again, like, Hey, how can I, build up my life again, even though I am, have this uh, diagnosis, I'm going to go and try to get my own home again and going to try find a girlfriend and do some volunteer work or travel. Um, so I got a goal. Um, I didn't know how to get there, but I was making steps towards their goal from being hospitalized. And that's what I've been doing the, the years after that, like, like six years after that. Okay. Rebuilding my life. Yeah, and let me ask you. So you were traumatized, <clears throat> obviously by the hospitalization, but the just the very fact of having the voices was a traumatizing element for you as well. That was, or you think it was traumatizing? It it really yeah. bothered you when this started happening. Yeah, I've been like in this this uh, existential panic, you know, that there's something inherently wrong with me because uh, those voices told me so. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what the psychiatry told me as well. And maybe and that's when years later, when I found uh, the hearing voices move, I learned about the relationship between voices and my life history. And I started making links with 
my my mother, of course, um, that passed away. But also, as a kid, I wasn't a happy kid because of what happened. Though I was an easy prey for buddies, and right, I was bullied as a kid, and I experienced those voices as buddies for a long time. Voices so, of the bullies? No, I experienced them as buddies. Like I was the uh, subject of bullying and oh, oppression. Oh, yeah, okay. so that's a link. Yeah. That that helps to understand. Hey, maybe it's got to do with these kinds of things, and it's a process of yeah, uh, learning to rise up and be assertive and and self uh, uh, conscious and self assured. You know. Mm -hmm. And this nurse that started asking you about your voices was it was a it was a guy. Yeah, he's got a funny name. He's called Ben Dunkbar, which in English means I'm thankful. Okay. <laughs> so I am thankful. am thankful, thankful. <laughs> yeah, he has, a, he has a very special name. Yeah, and I, and I got to be friends with him later on uh, in life. All right. Yeah. And was he associated with the Hearing Voices movement? No, no, no. Really? No, no. But yeah, years later, uh, as I... Uh, got my life back on track and learn how to, you know, take care of myself mentally and then try to rebuild my life. Uh, I felt like, Hey, maybe it's time to pick up my study psychology again, and then about hearing voices because I have a lot of experience with that now. And mm -hmm. so I started doing that uh, about brain research into hearing voices, which is an interesting subject. We can talk about it or not, but uh, that's what's what I was, what I was doing. <laughs> But then the first World Hearing Voices Congress started and their world opened up for me. I didn't know about, you know, but there were experts by experience telling their stories, uh, like I'm telling mine now, but, uh, that was all new to me. It's like 2009. It was new in the Netherlands, it was kind of new in the net in the world, you know? <laughs> wow. And, and this relationship between hearing voices and trauma and also that hearing voices is very common experience, like as common as being left-handed, you know, <laughs> it's wow. like, uh, 13% of the general population sometimes hear a voice 7% regularly and only like a uh, one or a half percent has the diagnosis of schizophrenia and hears voices. There are many people who don't have any diagnosis. They somehow can live with the voices. And for a lot of people, it's, it's a positive experience, actually, uh, like a spiritual experience. Um, mm -hmm. so and in, in tribal societies, it's just totally normal yeah. for people to have visions and they just call them visions and voices. You know? yeah. and that's it. It's part of their world. That's what I discovered in Australia. The, I went to the world Congress there and the Aboriginals, they, they talked for thousands of years with their ancestors and to the spirits of the land and, and the Maori people too. They call it the difficult gift. I think it's an appropriate mm. name. And, uh, and in Brazil, where I met you, uh, so uh, people yeah. are from Ubanda or, um, yeah, around the world, it's, it's from all times and all ages and in, in different societies, there's a really different understandings and much more support, you know, um, for people who hear voices and their traditions in how to understand them and cope with them and, um, have a role in, in the society, perhaps as a shaman. Yeah. Sure. And, and I want to get into that in the interview. Let's let's go to where we were talking about how you got involved with the Hearing Voices movement. Yeah. Um, so you went to this conference in 2009. Yeah. And then what? how did that go from there? Well, uh, that's where I discovered this, um, a worldwide Hearing Voices movement that started in the Netherlands in the 80s, um, which was relatively little known, uh, it, I didn't hear anything about it in my psychology ex education, but they, since the eighties, they've been building a worldwide community with, uh, with voice heroes themselves, you know, with self-help groups, with the idea that recovery is, is possible, you know, and it, it happens and, um, trying to emancipate hearing voices as a human experience, as a variation of mental diversity and not as a symptom of schizophrenia or something. And also with researchers, uh, Marius Rom and Sandra Asher, they, they started researching uh, the experiences of people with no diagnosis or voices and with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And 
they were the first ones to look at it as a as an experience and to map the experience and map the lives of the people and bringing voice heroes together so that they can help each other and they understand each other way much more than a psychiatrist understands a voice hero. Yeah? So it's peer support, one of the early early forms of peer support in psychiatry. And yeah. right, and you, you mentioned one name there, Mario Doman. Was that uh, Ma no? That's a different guy. He's interesting oh. as well. But uh, Mario is Roma. He's the oh, okay. the godfather. Sandra Asher is the godmother, and okay. uh, one of the first guys uh, that was involved was Derek Corstens, who, who you met as well in Brazil, who will be at. Uh, yeah. World Hearing Voices Congress in November in Brazil as well. And he, he developed some interesting stuff as well, uh, talking with the voices. Um, we, we might get into that later, but. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. And uh, yeah, and if he's coming down to Brazil, he'll probably fly through Sao Paulo. So if I can't get down to the conference, maybe I'll see if I can invite him out for dinner or something. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's a wonderful guy. And he had to, this really out of the box approach to just talk with the voices as a mental health care worker, he's a psychiatrist with the voices of somebody else. And it sounds like a really strange idea, but when it actually happens, you know, when the voice hearer is willing to do that and the voices themselves are willing to do that and you really enter into a, a respectful dialogue with each other, really magical things happen, voices that have been like tormenting people for years with all kinds of negative evil stuff <laughs> literally when you get to talk with them they explain themselves like hey we mean the opposite we want to help this person you know to uh, rise up for himself or herself and to take care of, of life and um yeah so th they have a helping intention these voices yeah. but they say it really negative and that i experienced <laughs> it myself as well it was really changing my recovery after I, somebody that uh, voice dialogue with me, this relationship changed from me being a subject of bullies to a kind of cooperation and friendship and the voice became friendly and I understood them, you know, uh, what, the, what they were trying to say. They understood me and yeah, it was an important change in my life. And I've seen it with, I've done it with other people as well and I read stories heard stories from people. It's such a, yeah, uh, uh, out of the box idea, but it, it's really interesting because many of the problems that voice hero experience got to do with uh, their beliefs that they are inherently negative or evil, those voices, and they say evil stuff. So it's, <laughs> yeah. I thought they were evil too, you know, it's easy to, to think that, but when you actually get into a good dialogue, they have a helpful intention, um, like the inner critic. Everybody knows the inner critic, whether you hear voices right. or not, you know, it wants to help you not to make mistakes, but when it's relentless, you won't be able to do anything because of the, all the critique all the time, you know, but it has a helpful, uh, yeah, function, uh, in, in essence. And when I think, yeah, I think these voices need some sort of training program because they're scaring the shit out of everybody. Yeah. And so it's like, look, voices, you got to try, you got to go another way about this because people yeah. are scared to death of you, you know. Yeah. Be a little nicer, you know. Yeah. Take some, uh, I don't know, politically correct training or something. You know? Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But also uh, when you talk with these voices, uh, many people find out that they carry a lot of, pain and anger from the person with them. That's a, that's okay. one of their functions, you know, to uh, the person doesn't want to experience that kind of shit that, that the person has experienced in the past. So yeah, that's, that's one Shows up there. Yeah. So it, it, it's, uh, yeah, like, like a kind of dissociative kind of function of, uh, uh carrying the trauma and, and saying in metaphors or or literally like hey there's something here inside you that needs some attention and care you know <laughs> uh, yeah for sure can you tell us a story about one of your voices that you've worked with that you felt like you transformed while you're at the hearing voices network yeah um, um yeah sure 
uh, one of the voices because it was different every day, also different voices, you know, of unknown people and sometimes Dutch, sometimes English. Um, and some were recurring and one of the recurring voices was an English voice actually. And he was talking about mm -hmm. stuff that I've been reading in English as well. Maybe that's where it evolved from and what I was reading. It used to be a lot of psychology stuff, but of spirituality stuff, also some conspiracy stuff and the song lyrics. And that's what got into the mix and what the voice was saying, you know, but also when most of the time it was quite literally negative and I interpreted pretty negative, you know, but uh, later on, um, after this voice dialogue and after I, um, I rebuilt my life and, and, you know, process through the traumas and find, uh, take responsibility for all kinds of things in my life, you know, uh, my home, uh, the relationship, work, study, and find a kind of balance, you know, I found that, um, uh, that voice kind of, uh, collided with my own inner voice more and that it kind of evaporated or integrated, you know, with my own inner voice. So that's, that's kind of a nice, uh, nice story, but it's, this is a process in like 30, 15 years, you know? Yeah. Um, but how, how about a conversation go? Like, like if you were, imagine you were having a voice right now, could you uh, let us me, in on what it would be like? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't converse much with the voices. And I had uh, the uh -huh. amazing insight uh, not long ago because for years I've been hearing voices and I was either uh, when I was busy doing something like I'm talking to you now, there was no room, room for the voices or when I was using my inner voice uh, to draw them out. But, for a long time when I was doing nothing, was just relaxing, these voices would come immediately. But then after I started working at this hearing voices support center, and like I said, things, I, I was paying attention to a lot of things in my life and taking good care of my mental health. And sometimes I experienced, hey, it's becoming silent when I'm relaxing. That's new, you know? Mm -hmm. And then last years have been really in, uh, intensive because uh, I was working and putting up, you know, this voice support center, writing a book, making courses, and traveling the world. That's busy, but also I got two young kids of like four and uh, seven years old. So I'm busy from when I wake up to I go to bed. There's not much room. And every time I, I relax now, I've been doing that a lot, like also kind of mindfulness and relaxational exercises. It stays pretty much quiet. That's what I found out just a couple of months ago. Hi, it's relatively quiet. It's now just hmm. maybe my, maybe twice a day or a couple of times a week while it used to be like 50 times a day. And yeah. And in the beginning it was all day long, you know, so. Wow. And yeah. do you attribute talking to the voices and sort of working through your issues as the main reason that they've dissipated? Yeah. It's like there's an active approach to the voices, uh, like you turn towards the voice, you enter in the dialogue with them, you you um, try to figure out what they mean, or some people have like a diary. Or, and I've, I've been working a lot with hearing voices. It's my job, you know, for 10 years now, I've been reading and writing and, and teaching about this. And so I know a lot about it. I understand it in different ways. So. It, it, for a long time, it was no problem the hearing uh, voices when they occurred. But um, I think nowadays I have a non-active way of coping because I'm just leading my life. And it includes taking daily care of my mental health. <laughs> but um, Do you take medication? I can't remember. I, I uh, tapered off or, yeah, I built it off like uh, 10 years ago. 10 years uh, ago. But, but one of these... So, uh, one of these, um, how do you call it, withdrawal effects okay. is that you have difficulties with sleep. And okay. um, when my ch children were born, uh, it was very intensive and Stress. had nights of no sleep at all, not because of the children, because I couldn't sleep. You know, I had too much stress in my body or in my mind. Um, and I think it's part of like a long-term withdrawal effect of taking these uh 
and uh, psychotics for such a long time, you know. So eventually, uh, I decided to take the smallest dose of the old antipsychotics just as a pure for sleep because I, I need my sleep. I cannot uh, function properly or, or feel uh, good uh, if I don't have enough sleep. You know, it's important. And I'm trying to taper that off again. But yeah, it's a kind of catch-22, you know. Uh, I was really happy that I, I built it off uh, or... or how do you call it? Uh, uh, tapered off the medicine, and it went good for a long time. But yeah, having kids and working, I, I just had found a balance between work and the rest of my life and the inside of my head. And then I got two children, and I moved away. And I, yeah, it's it's a lot to take care of, you know. Uh, yeah, sure. But, so let me ask: so if if I came to the center, mm -hmm. uh, um. Hearing voices, is it a center? Yeah, it's a, uh, uh, what we call it a point center, a your voices support center. Okay, um, support center? Yeah, and it's run by experts by experience. Uh, not everybody knows that term, but that's what um, uh, people with lived experience who work in mental health care are called, experts by experience. Like, right. And this uh, is the place you founded? Yeah. Yeah, you founded the support center, which is amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and you're actually the first one I talked with it because like five days ago, we had our 10 year <laughs> anniversary. So wow. uh, we're going to party this year. Yeah. yeah. Who, who funds it or does anybody fund it? Yeah. We're part of like a social psychiatric, um, care organization that doesn't give uh, treatment, but give, you know, support on all kinds of areas of life for people with, uh, psychiatric background um, and we are we have a team of experts by experience here are workers um, and a big part of that is just general recovery oriented stuff and within that team we have the hearing voices support center okay. focus on that and we are there for the people who hear voices we offer a lot of peer support like hearing voices groups individual support but we're also there for the family and friends who hear voices and for mental health care workers because a lot of people have question marks from what is this hearing voices and how can I understand this and how can I cope with this from my position, you know? So, yeah. and we do a course as well with these three kinds of people together and we find out we're all just people, you know, who everybody shares their experiences uh, in life and in recovery and with stigma or emancipation. And, we get a taste of, of, you know, after a couple of sessions, we are just there as a person, not anymore in the role of a mental health care worker or a psychiatric patient or client. You're, you're as, a, yeah. as a person there. And that's really, we, we, we try to stimulate a, you know, a dialogue, uh, different experiences, different ideas, and everybody has the right to choose their own ways of giving meaning to the experience or to cope with it in their own way or find the support they they feel they need you know mm -hmm. yeah. and this this peer center are there um professional staff there as well like licensed mm -hmm. psychologists licensed psychiatrists no but i, I uh, did a little bit of psychology study and my colleague uh, Inika as well but we we our work is there just pure as uh, expert by experience or peer worker okay but we, uh, for me, it we have been really helpful uh, because in the course as well and in the book, uh, uh, I try to uh, summarize in, in normal, like everyday language, uh, all the insights from lived experience, the experiential knowledge, but also from scientific knowledge and also from like uh, therapeutic knowledge. So that you have different perspectives. Yeah, the, I mean, the Netherlands, the Amster, Amsterdam, that area, you guys do a lot of interesting stuff. And we first, I think maybe we met briefly in the second Crazy Wise conference yeah. uh, in in Rotterdam. I, I believe you asked me a question and yeah. uh, I didn't know the answer, <laughs> but I remember you sort of popping your hand up there. And But yeah. I remember one place we were at in the Netherlands, um, it was a clinic some kind of clinic and it was two um homes on a downtown street and so there were like row homes and then one home was all peer people 
And then the other home was all professional. And they had they had no wall between the homes, but they had like a little white line. And so depending on what your needs were, um, dealing with the whatever kind of disorder or state you were in, you could have your choice of whether you wanted the peer side or the professional side. And, and I thought that was really cool. I think uh, we, we did the course there last year. It's also people who co organized the Crazy Wise conference. It's uh, the Brouwerij in Amsterdam. Yeah, that's a and this really beautiful uh, place. They, they mix that peer support side with, and also critical psychology side uh, with psychological treatments. And uh, yeah, uh, I think that's party a nice there. mix. It was pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> after party. Yeah, there was an there was a crazy wise after party, and actually it was a really good party. I really had a good time. I always have a good time when I'm in the Netherlands. It's like my favorite. Favorite spot outside Brazil, you know. Uh, and Canada, maybe. Third. Canada's <laughs> third. <laughs> Family's there, so that's always going to be on the list. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, cool things happening now in the Netherlands because, you know, we talked about this old ID, and I guess it was kind of the same for the diagnosis of bipolar, you know. For schizophrenia, it was like a lifelong disease. Don't talk about your experiences because you might get into a crisis use uh, medication for the rest of your life. Don't talk about uh, trauma as well. And what you experience is not real. What you think is not right. You know, that's where we're coming from. Uh, uh -huh. and now there's like a 180 degree uh, change. You know, now it's like, hey, it's a, it's a human variation and it can become a problem, but you can learn how to live with it. And the trauma plays in the be trauma informed, you know, and it's good to talk about these things. And you can taper off your medication or recover without medication. So these this theme, like you said, trauma informed therapy. Um, that's you see that growing in the Netherlands. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the cool things, and the Crazy Wives conferences as well, they contribute to that. Is like the emancipation of, of spirituality in mental health care. Because it used to be like hearing voices as well, like this from all ages has been seen as one of these spiritual experiences and also mm. uh, spiritual beliefs. They were seen as a delusion. And now there's a, a reappreciation of that. Also the work of Eva Auerhand, uh, she did a PhD on that and showing people with diagnosis of bipolar, like 70% have, <coughs> pardon me, have uh, a spiritual experience, a meaningful and uh, yeah, helpful experience. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a significant number, and it's ignored. You know, it's just completely ignored. Yeah. And even at the Crazy Wise conference, even even at the first Crazy Wise conference, I was the only one speaking about spirituality, yeah. and and people, even in the peer support movement at the time, didn't want to talk about spirituality because they associated it with religious dogma. And yeah. so they sort of saw that topic as anti-diversity to say, I yeah. had a spiritual experience, you know, yeah. and, and now it's opening up more and they're realizing that, you know, if you don't let people talk about your experiences, you're not being particularly diverse. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. It's, it's opening up in, in a bigger way. And even the transpersonal in the opposite side, I've been to transpersonal psychology movements, uh, conferences and six, seven years ago, they weren't talking about mental disorders. They weren't yeah. talking about that at all. They're all talking about peak experiences, enlightenment and all that crap. Yeah, and yeah. now they're talking about spiritual emergency and disorder and bipolar and the spiritual experiences of bipolar. Yeah, yeah. And that's starting to happen now in the transpersonal side. So they're, they're coming together. They're dovetailing on both ends. Yeah, that's what I think is really beautiful. And uh, there's uh, another stream as well. So you have to like the recovery movement and the uh, spirituality approaches, spiritual traditions. Um, but also uh, from a human rights perspective, it's really important that everybody has a right to their own spirituality, their own religion, their own beliefs, their own practices. You know, and there has been um, a, a UN, uh, how, how do you call it in English? Um, United Nations? Yeah, uh, about a treaty, kind of like a treaty, you know, okay. that they uh, about the human rights of people who have some sort of physical or mental um, problem, 
you know, uh, it's been, it's a declaration of the human rights with people who have a diagnosis in short. And that's really starting to take off a little bit. And, and one of the aspects is like, hey, the mental health care should be co-created with people with lived experience. And, and yeah, uh, mm -hmm. there should be room for spirituality and like uh, shared decision making and nothing about us without us. Yeah, and I saw that as well at a conference. I went to a psychiatric nursing conference in Riga, Latvia a few years ago. Okay. And all it was about, every single room I went into was about more uh, peer or patient involvement. You know, yeah. These are psychiatric nurses. They wanted more feedback from patients in every direction. And yeah. every piece of research they showed was like, that's a good thing. We should be doing this. We should have more patient involvement. It's yeah. not like we need to treat you. We need to hear from you, you know? So yeah. things are changing. They, I was the only one talking about spirituality, yeah, but they but were the, very respected or re receptive and they love what I had to say. I mean, I was yeah. really shocked. Yeah. And, and it is interesting what you're trying to say. And it is an important area of life for everybody. It's part of the human condition, you know? If, if ignoring that part it is, is it almost by definition <laughs> uh, bad for your mental health, uh, you know, spirituality yeah. in, in, a, in a broad sense, you know, it can be for some people, it's like uh, conversing with uh, angels or spirits or doing ceremonies or, having, you know, but it can also be uh, like uh, your connection that you feel with, with nature or with the world or the appreciation of the beauty uh, in life. I mean, everybody giving meaning to life, you know, all the life questions, the existential questions, they are essential to being human. And, and a lot of it has to do with spirituality. So there was one interesting thing in the World Hearing Voices Congress a couple of years ago in the Netherlands, human rights was the theme and we made a manifesto about the human rights of voice hearers. And we, I got to hand it over to the UN reporter of mental health. And he had a talk. Uh, he said, like, every human rights violation is bad for your health, the health and recovery and mental health uh, and, and, and human rights are intertwined because all these traumas of violence, of uh, abuse, it's, it's a violation of a human right, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, and also in recovery, you need safety to, to talk about things, you know, for instance, sure. you have the right to express yourself. Um, so w when you really look at, at the problems that people face in life, a lot of it has to do with human rights violations. And if you look at the things that help people in recovery are actually the situations when their rights are respected, that you are respected as a human being and you are facilitated to find the things you need in life to live a good life, you know? So I'm really enthusiastic about it. And for, for us as experts by experience, it left in the Netherlands that it's becoming a profession now within the mental health care. Mm -hmm. In the meanwhile, trying to stay <laughs> critical and free, you know, it's kind of difficult <laughs> because we don't want to get caught up in the system, but it's happening now uh, as a, as a fully acknowledged uh, profession. Oops. So yeah, I think I think my former client Tim Canote is yeah. is kind of moving in that direction because he, he works at the psychiatric hospitals now. You know? Yeah, I used and, to work there he, too. Yeah, okay, the same hospital he's at. Yeah, or, or yeah, and yeah, and he's kind of doing what your nurse friend was doing. He's sort of quietly subverting the system from the inside. You know, yeah. he's like everything the psychiatrists <laughs> are doing. He's sort of steering it in the opposite direction. So yeah, and it's just all people, you know, like when you connect to a mental health care worker or uh, somebody going through a mental crisis or a family member, if you connect in a uh, sincere, honest way, then you can facilitate the, the free space that you need for recovery, you know. But, you you know, what you're mentioning here is is kind of dovetailing with my work in a way. Because, you know, I, I started out doing the retreats and I'm, I'm kind of focusing on a variation of Stan Groff's holotropic breath work 
I'm mm -hmm. a certified holotropic breathwork facilitator doing breathwork on retreats and it's all going fine. It's all going great. But I'm noticing a few things. First is that my clients are not breathing that much to go into an ordinary state. Mm -hmm. Maybe a few breaths and within five minutes they're gone. You know? mm -hmm. Typical person, it's like 20 minutes. And mm -hmm. then we realize as well that we didn't even need to have them breathe to go into healing states and healing processes. All we needed to do was put down a yoga mat, give them a safe space, ask the client how they want us positioned. Like, Sean, I want you closer to me. Um, uh, Tim I, or Robin, I want you closer to or a little further away. I need a blanket here, a pillow there. And then stuff would happen. Wonderful. And, right? and, and of course, they would say whatever they wanted as well. They could speak, they could move, they could cry. But just having a safe space where you know it's just for you emotionally yeah. and everything is there for you, your emotions, your life experience, everything you want to share. And mm -hmm. that goes a long way. You know? yeah. and, and what's the therapeutic technique? Well, really nothing at all. It's just preserving a space for the person. Yeah. You know, with it's like a, a, the, the setting, you know, the, yeah, yeah, and, and setting. Um, appreciating somebody's needs. Uh, what you are saying is really beautiful because that's, that's the same thing I was trying to say about human rights, the needs, you know, maybe all the emotions that people go through are messengers of the needs, unfulfilled needs that people carry with them and the voices as well, maybe messengers of the, uh, those needs, you know, and when those needs are fulfilled, the need for yeah. safety, the need for agency, the need for uh, true, uh, for dignity, for respect, for understanding, you know, that's healing <laughs> and everybody can do it. It's you know, human nature, but so strange that psychiatry has gone, has alienated so much from human nature, actually. But, yeah. I hope it's coming back more and more. Things, I think it's wonderful, man. The word. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. No, I think there's a lot of parallels with the Hearing Voices movement. And um, one thing that's really interesting, too, is like I do what I call surrogate breath work for my clients, where in, in that sacred space, I've taken on their energies in some way that's unconscious to me. Okay. It's, there's this healing field and it's sending an energy to me most of the time. If, Actually, all the time, you know, when things are right, it comes my way. When I started doing this, what I called surrogate breath work, breathing on behalf of my clients, I got, I started to get a lot of voices coming up in the sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Inside your head or inside? Yeah. Oh. yeah. During the sessions. And I remember one of the funniest was one of the first times I was doing this technique, a girl in Seattle, we had had a good retreat, but there was a little bit of resistance there. It was kind of up and down. And she had a little time, uh, difficult time trusting me a little bit. And then I had a really powerful experience on one of my last days with her. And I kind of gave her a hug and there was a little bit of guardedness there. And I, I laid down and I, I said to myself, I was like, she just doesn't get it. She doesn't get it. And then this voice said, no, but she'll learn. And I went, yeah, <laughs> she'll learn. Wow. And then I was like, wait a second, wait, where did that come from? <laughs> and it was, I saw there was like an avatar of like an Indian guru who sort of came wow. into my vision, you know, with this sort of wow. knowing way. And, and that was great. You know? And then even for myself, I was laying in bed. I was sort of in a half dream state mm -hmm. and I was frustrated with the way my work was going. And I was like, this is so Why? I was like almost talking to God, like, why does this have to be so hard like this? Right. And then I had this soothing voice of a beautiful woman that came in wow. and said, Sean, we all needed to go through this. Yeah. And I was like, who, who, where, where is that coming from? Like, who are you? Oh. Who's had to go through what, you know? And, and then I realized that what she was talking about or what I was talking to was some sort of higher dimension entity, like an angel. Mm -hmm. And I realized that this healing process that we're all on is, is taking us to more subtle and subtle dimensions. And some of those dimensions are angelic, you know? Mm -hmm. And so actually what angels are, angels are, well, what we think of as angels, 
angels are us. They've just <laughs> done more work than we have. That's how I come to understand it anyways. Yeah. You know? So she's like, well, we all needed to go through this. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Oh, who, what, where? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and the more I've opened up to uh, hearing voices, <laughs> the more um, it's just a matter of, it's an easy thing for me, you know? Uh, and sometimes it comes really visual. Sometimes it comes in a dream. Yeah. Sometimes it's in breath work. Um, but always uh, manageable, you know? If if I have difficult experiences, it comes through in dreaming, mm. you know, where I get really dark stuff come up from my clients or even from my own life. Um, and and it's I think it's handled better in the dream state. I wouldn't want to be managing these kind of voices while I'm conscious and trying to function. You know? Yeah. And that's where it kind of gets in the way, right? Yeah, that's that's when you hear it all the time, you know. That we also have like um, an exercise where you can try, and for people who don't hear voices, they can get a little taste of it. But when you imagine this stuff happening while you are doing your thing, while you're walking down the street, and you have like these uh, people uh, telling to kill yourself or that you're worthless all the time, you know. I, I have immense respect for everybody who hears voices and for everybody in general, but these negative voices, these people are actually, I think really powerful that they live with that, even though it's a struggle sometimes, you know, and it can change during recovery, but it's, it's a really, yeah, like the Maori say, it's a difficult gift, but these experiences mm -hmm. you talk about uh, sound really, uh, these voices sound really helpful and understanding. That's, sure. that's really nice, yeah. man. Yeah. Well, and the, you know, the, the training I got in Holotropic breath work, it opens your mind and gives you practice with a wide range of inner experiences, you know, um, visions and voices and, and of all kinds of things, or even like, for example, becoming animals and those animals can be like symbolic archetypes for how you're feeling in your life, you know? So like in breath work, I once had a vision that I became a salamander on a beach in Indonesia. Wow. Yeah. E yeah. yeah. Oh, did we talk about that? No, another time, but yeah. Okay. You told me the story. Wonderful. Yeah. And I just started laughing my ass off, but it got me in touch with this primal um, vitality, you know, of just being on a beach and eating bugs that are walking by, you know, whatever's coming by. <laughs> I've got it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that was, it was good to get in touch with that, that part of it because it was a part of me that had been a little bit suppressed. You know? Yeah. So getting in touch with that gave me a little bit more vitality, right? Um, yeah. I like what you're saying because these kind of experiences and like also kind of channeling kind of thing and the, the breath work you do, you, you told that people get into that uh, all stay really fast. I think it's a, maybe a, um, these these types of experiences and associative kind of experiences they're kind of similar and dream like experiences um, um, and I think it's maybe just a part of our humanity you know like channeling stuff in the preparation we talked a little bit about this but when uh, I think channeling ha happens all the time when I'm reading a book of Carl Jung I get um, ideas that are similar to Carl Jung's when I'm playing like Jimi Hendrix on my guitar, it's kind of a, a channeling, you know? Uh, and it's maybe also what this voice dialogue is talking with voices. If if you get give these voices a chance to express themselves and, and maybe ask what they like or like to do, you know, they can finally be present and express themselves in a, in a positive way, you know, and they can release that energy as well. So uh, when when there are problems and it's you're not conscious of these things and not using the positive sides, yeah, you can really uh, get in, in, into a crisis. But you can maybe it's also a uh, kind of talent that you can learn to use. You know, um, yeah, like like the famous words of uh, I don't like the word schizophrenia, but this, this quote of and the, the schizophrenic is drowning in the same sea that the mystic is swimming in. Maybe you can sure. have this, is it part of like, you know, this uh, uh, wounded healer kind of story that you can learn how to swim. Uh, it's a nice, 
circle around what we talked earlier, but For sure. maybe, maybe the same processes are happening, but they are in the, in the, in the crisis state, um, not, uh, harmonious at that moment, but when you can learn to harmonize these energies, yeah, you can fly, uh, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. Yeah. <laughs> well, you reminded me when you mentioned Jung, I read his autobiography when I, two years before my first, my only hospitalization. And in the three, the few days during while I was reading his book, my dream world just popped, man. It was like psychedelic, totally vivid dreams like I've never had before. Who is book? What's this? Young's book, Memories, uh, Dreams, and Reflections, oh, yeah. his autobiography. Uh, so yeah. when you said like you're reading Young, it's like you're channeling Young, you know? And then I, and I mentioned, I think in our previous conversation, um, after my, my brother-in-law was a chess master, a chess champion of Brazil, actually, wow. uh, grandmaster of Brazil. And after being with him for a few hours, when I go back to play chess, my chess scores just go through the roof. Yeah. My, my, my rating jumps like 100 and 150 points in the two weeks after I've talked to him. It's yeah. really crazy because he gets me feeling <clears throat> like a chess champion. You yeah. know? And that just brings a whole different orientation than the way I'm usually used to. You know? So it's, it's interesting that, you know, we've got channeling spirits, but we're also channeling each other sometimes, you know, like I'm yeah. channeling you, you're channeling me right now. We've got that connection. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, I think a lot has yeah. to do also with the focus, you know, when you, where you focus on that gets bigger in your attention that you absorb these things that you focus on. And when you focus on worrisome and, and uh, scary stuff, uh, you know, that comes really big, uh, in your experience. But I think for me, it has been really helpful to tap into your sources of inspiration, you know, and it can be. Like we said, Carl Jung, Jimi Hendrix, or nature, whatever it is, but where you focus on that, that's what, uh, what you absorb, you know, and this may be a part of this process of kind of, yeah, natural channeling that we do maybe all the time. Mm -hmm. And I've got um, a friend of mine down here in Brazil. She received a diagnosis of schizophrenia and she went to an Ubanda center, which is where they channel African spirits. Yeah. And she wanted to let me know and that she was doing this. And, and I went to one of the Ubanda centers and, and watched her channeling it. I'm not sure how it's helped her, but she told me it's helped her, you know, and I, and I felt like it was helping her too, you know, just, Wonderful. and, and I, and I have a, a guy actually who's coming tomorrow to my, to my home, <laughs> to do a, a short retreat, a short informal retreat, mm -hmm. who does Ubanda as well. And I asked him, I said, what's the difference between channeling spirits through Ubanda, this channeling these African gods like Orisha, you know, yeah, yeah. or or, um, or doing all the trumpet <coughs> breath work, which is what I'm doing, this sort of clinical, studied, Stan Groff approved psychology thing, you know. I said, is there a relationship? And he said, yeah, there is. I said, what's that? He says, they're both teaching you to surrender to what's going on inside of you. Yeah. So with breath work, you're surrendering to your feelings and the music mm -hmm. that's going on and expressing yourself. And in Ubanda, you're surrendering to this spirit that wants to come through you. Yeah. So they both have this essence of surrender, which yeah. helps me make sense of why Ubanda has been helpful to some people. You know? And maybe, you know, the spirit comes from the word breath, right? If I understand it correctly. So mm -hmm. maybe that, yeah. But I like the, the surrender stuff. It's also maybe uh, to step out of this fight or flight or freeze response that people have to stressful events, you know. And a lot of people with mental problems are struggling with these kinds of responses that sometimes happen at the same time. But when you surrender and in a safe environment, like you talked in your sessions, you know, then, then things are, it can uh, come up from inside, from the unconscious, uh, but it doesn't feels like a threat that you need to flee from or fight against, you know, the surrender bypasses that 
those three dominant responses you know, for for really for for real recovery to take place you know the you need to find that somewhere in your life i think uh, mm -hmm. otherwise you're running or fighting all the time and yeah there's no peace mm -hmm. in that you know well while we're talking about surrender the up came these feelings in me because because my cat was killed over the weekend we live in a forested area and we suspect that a puma got her yeah yeah and uh I don't know, man. It's like we started talking about surrender and there was a part of me that was just like, keep it together, keep it together, keep it together. You're in an interview. You know, <laughs> this is oh. what you're going to put on YouTube. Yeah. And then it just started to really surface. And I, and I thought, and I actually thought when it was coming up, I really thought I was going to burst into tears, you know, like, yeah. and, and yeah. I thought I was going to lose my shit right here in the middle of our interview. That's all then, right, man. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. And I know <laughs> yeah. you're cool with it, so it was okay. And I'm like, well, I can always edit that out later if I have to. But then just getting these words out and and giving people a little bit of insight of what it means to surrender, you know, that because there was a part of me that was like, don't go there, don't mm. go, don't bring this up. But okay, yeah, I just see. telling you that is, um, uh, then the energy dispersed, you know dispersed but it was i'll just say it was beautiful cat feral and we we sort of brought her into our home very slowly let her out every night running through the forest jungle every night you know back home wow. 6 a.m and um and very interesting having this feral cat in our lives that and and a real sincere love from her to us and from us to her and then i came down one morning last week and she was just gone and that was it yeah. And she never came back and I never found really, her. <laughs> no, no, just we the area is big and forested. We've got no chance. But one of our neighbor, one of actually our cleaning woman had seen a puma last uh, a few months ago, like in the neighborhood. Yeah. You know, so that's my best guess as to what happened. But uh, yeah, this uh, podcast is dedicated to Zen. And maybe I'll have some visions or voices about Zen. You know, I've already. Zen. I, yeah. I've already had, yeah, it was Zen because she became a teacher of mine Yeah, wonderful. because she would run away unless we were really quiet, right? Yeah. So we would yeah. just sit outside and be like meditating and then she would come closer. And then if we talk, she'd take off. So she was like a Zen master. She's teaching us yeah. how, to, how to respond to her. It's, it's know, a my beautiful, beautiful metaphor for what we were talking about, this surrender thing, you know, uh, to be with mm -hmm. hurt, you know. You have to calm down, quiet down, and to be with it, and not fight it or run away from it or or freeze like I can do everything, but just to mm -hmm. be present with the hurts because that's what's underneath the, all that stuff, you know. It's it's and sure. my kids they learn the same thing from from the cats uh, at, their, at their mom's place, you know, with the really nice cats as well. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful. Uh, what you talked about the cat and it's it wow. shows your 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 grief uh, oh. shows your love for uh, the cat. so <laughs> loved her to death i mean really <laughs> did love this cat to death yeah um and then when we realized that she wasn't coming back the second day i mean i really first i really lost my shit i mean i just completely broke down but then i wanted a dream and then that night this dream came to me and it was a young man a young brazilian man but it was Zen. It was the cat in a body of a man, a boy. Yeah. And the boy said to me, uh, and there was a big hug between us, this warm embrace, um, as me being her trainer in a way. Mm. And she said, um, you, you don't need to worry about me. I wish I was there to worry about you or like to take care of you as I'm getting into my older age. You know, it was like that. Yeah. And we hugged and it was beautiful, you know. Wow. Um, but it was like, wow, Zen came back to me in a dream as a young Brazilian man. Yeah. Maybe she's been reincarnated. 
<laughs> yeah, some carrying some spirits. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I know it was her energy and it, and it helped a lot, you know. This yeah. type of vision and dreams, you know, that helps when you when you're dealing with somebody who's passed away to have mm -hmm. a vision of somebody who's who's died and and sends a message of some kind can be very helpful. I experienced the same because I, I, earlier I said I, I don't hear voices that much anymore, but I see uh, visions still regularly, especially when I do kind of mindfulness or relaxation or exercise. And my dad passed away last year and I see him regularly. It's like in, in dreams and in visions and voices, it transcends life and death, you know, and it helps me to um, also because by now in my life, I have this worldview where this is all possible, you know, it's okay. And it's nice to, to somehow have a, a connection with that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a transcendent uh, part of life and, uh, and it makes the, the normal life, it, uh, complements it with, with things that aren't here in the, in, in the physical life, you know, yeah. mm -hmm, for sure, for sure. And I've actually had a number of people in my life who've died, who've come to me in dreams. Yeah. And and we've had extended conversations. One particular situation, I'm in, I'm in my car with this friend of mine who died at like 49 years old, you know, of cancer. Hadn't okay. been close to him for a number of years, but I'm in the car. And I said to, I said to him, I said, so how are you doing? And he says, good, good. You know, I'm working on this project. I'm working on that project. I said, but aren't you, aren't you dead? Aren't you supposed to be dead? He goes, yeah. And I said, well, what's going on? He says, I'm having trouble letting go, ordering pizza with you guys, playing softball. Like he was missing the little things of life, you know? Oh, wow. And then I said, is there anything I can do to help? And he said, yeah, there is. Now I'm going to get emotional again when I'm thinking about this. Um, it's okay, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm still trying to hold it together just so I can get the conversation out. You know, yeah. he said to me, he said, I'd like you to send a message to my mother. And I said, what's the message? And he said, you know, I, uh, there were many times in life when I felt disconnected, disconnected and separate from people. But Um, but she was always in my corner. And if you could just tell her that and how much I appreciated it while I was wow. alive. Wow. Yes. Huh. Sweet. And then, uh, yeah. And I wrote, I wrote her on Facebook and, uh, she really appreciated it. And, and when my dad passed away years later, the, his father came over and, and spoke to my mother and said, you know, um, uh, the the mother really appreciated that message that came through because yeah. it, it struck so close to home. You know? I yeah. have no doubt in my mind. I was talking to Chris. My friend. Yeah. yeah. No doubt in my mind. Wonderful. And I had other dreams with him as well. So, yeah. I hear a lot of love, you know, uh, and appreciation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, special man. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this whole thing with the cat has really opened me up. Yeah. Again, yeah, Zen was my teacher, man. Zen was no doubt was, was my teacher, and this has been a hard lesson the last two days. But I'm starting yeah. to see. I'm starting to feel like the sense of things. You know? And and you know, it's what you do in your retreats as well to help people get into these re deep realizational states, and that's that's what cats are all about. You know, they want it chill i I'm, I'm i mean yeah that's what i like about cats when they feel you are relaxed and they feel it's safe and they come to you and you caress the cat that's what you do in in your retreats yeah you know yeah, yeah in, in a way sure to create that uh, that safe space so you can have deep relaxation mm -hmm. um yeah you know, dogs, they just love whatever's coming at them. You know, you give dog a little attention, they're all over you. Yeah. But, um, and, I, and I've really seen it, and it's been emphasized with this feral cat experience, yeah. that your cat or a cat 
really responds to you in how you're coming to them. And, and there, and there can't be any ego there. If mm. you're trying to steer the relationship with a the cat, they're gone you know? yeah. or they're swiping at you. Like you need to be very receptive to the signals they're giving you. And that requires yeah. a lot of surrender and humility. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I also did some, sometimes when I was, I talked about how I coped with the voices, with my inner voice, developing my own inner voice. And I sometimes experimented a little bit with telepathy. I also put okay. it to the, to the test one time mm -hmm. with my former girlfriend, just cards naming whether they're black or, or red. Or a real I, psychic test. Huh? Yeah. And I was way worse than chance, but <laughs> other experiences. For instance, with a cat, you know, and there was this cat from the neighbors. And I used, we used to have a cat when I was a kid that was really smart. It, it could open up the door by itself. And every night it came uh -huh. to my room, opened up the door by itself and lay uh, near my feet on the bed. And that was such a nice memory. So in my head, I asked the cat to come over. <laughs> And to lay at, at my bed, which, which the cat ne never had done. And it happened, you know. And if it's telepathy or not, I don't know, but it happened. Uh, yeah, one time we were the, we lost the cat, you know, and I was saying, hey, cat, where are you? Please come here. And then this cat comes. It may be all coincidences, synchronicities, but I feel like there's, uh, for me, it felt also like, hey, there's, there's a telepathic connection. You know? but, well, you know, we, we had a client years ago. Uh, one of the first people we worked with voluntarily and it was kind of a spontaneous thing. Like I was saying, we were just sitting to meditate. We were supposed to work with his girlfriend. That was the intention of the, the weekend. Mm -hmm. And he just, after 10 minutes of meditating, he just started to throw up. He was mm -hmm. vomiting Whoa. and he was running to the bathroom like every five minutes, you know, and uh, one the second day when he was throwing up in the bathroom, his cat started throwing up at the same time. <laughs> so he's vomiting. The cat's vomiting. I'm like, something really weird is going on here. I don't know what it is, but it's weird. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. all this guy needed going back was a safe space. And I just saw a picture of this guy on Facebook and he just graduated with a degree in psychology. Down wow. There, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and he, and trust me, this guy was a mess. He was a mess. And I was a little bit afraid of him when we worked with him in, in 2008, I think. Yeah. But to see him shaven and in his graduation gown and getting his degree, I'm like, <laughs> wow, is that the same guy? We used to call him the city sujo, the dirty crab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was his nickname, city sujo, dirty crab. And uh, uh, yeah. now he's like, he's a... Uh, Psychologist, but if you if you meet me now, um, 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 like what how much time? Nineteen years ago, you would find me on the streets screaming to my voices with a beard like this, and the only thing I had were the clothes I was wearing. You know, wow. it's the same guy. Yeah, but maybe what the, what the voice told you, like um, we all go through this. Maybe it's just part of like human development after somewhere in life, psycho spiritual development, you know? Yeah. You know, it's, I think it's just such a sad thing that when people go to a psychiatrist, most of the time they're eventually told that there's no healing for you. Yeah. You can't heal your voice is, Oh, I'm sorry. You can't get better. You know? And, and that's, you're a that's, great example of amazing improvement, you know? That's, that's just the harm done by that message, you know, is so incredibly big. I think uh, psychiatry owes a big apology to, to the millions of people around the world because of the way of diagnosing and treating people, you know, and it's really bad. Uh, the last year, there was this guy who visited the Hearing Voice Support Center. He was brought by his dad. His dad was full motivated, but the guy... He didn't want to talk about this experience mm -hmm. and um, the, his story, and it's been published in the paper so I can uh, share it with you, is that uh, while he was traveling, he was uh, having a crisis and then 
he came to the Netherlands and the psychiatrist has told him like, yeah, you have a lifelong disease. This won't go away. You will have to learn to live with it. And the next day he had his first suicide attempt. And then a couple of weeks later, again, and wow. then he came uh, living with his parents and things seemed to be coming better again. And in the sense he was getting active, getting a job and taking care of himself, but he didn't want to talk about the voices. So when he was at the hearing voices support center, I said, uh, we talked a little bit, but I, I saw he didn't want to talk about it. I said, we don't have to talk about it. We can do something else. So we went outside oh. and talked with the people there and we had a, a, a nice meeting there. He was a really bright, young, intelligent man, but eventually uh, when things seemed to be going well on the outside, he, he committed suicide after all. Mm. And yeah, this, this suicidal stuff really started when he got this message, you, you have a lifelong disease, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it takes away hope, you know, and, and we have a, a, a kind of similar message that hey, you can learn to live with voices, but we say it's a human experience, you know, and a meaningful experience. And it's, uh, it's, a uh, something natural that you are experiencing and you can learn to understand it and live with it. Um, but it's not uh, a, a symptom of a disease or a disorder a priori, you know? Um, sure, sure. Yeah. I'm of the mindset, especially after having this conversation, that what we're working with is what I call bioenergetic material of our chakra system, like our soul, you know? Mm. Some of that energy is stuck due to trauma, like there's blockages. Mm. And then whatever you need to do, whatever technique it is that releases those blockages, converts yeah. that energy into something helpful. Yeah. And that's the healing, you know, yeah. And, yeah. And, and that's what I'm doing on my work with the bipolar breath work on retreats. It's what I'm doing in distance work. And it sounds like that's what you're doing when you're encouraging people to talk about the voices. You're opening up these channels that are trying to be heard mm. and we're ignoring them. We're pathologizing and ignoring saying, get go away. Yeah. And we also want to move also more to nonverbal ways of, of expressing, you know, so we're going to make music here soon and, and oh, work yeah. with art because yeah, what you say, it really resonates with me. For me, going to a metal concert and being in the Morse pit is such a catharsis of energy. I can throw mm. everything, all the build up frustration or, or whatever in a positive way, you know? So I think, uh, man, how do you call it? Um, an alchemy, you know, it's a transmutation process of emotions. Uh, everything that gives ecstasy and not like a uh, drug or something, or has, doesn't have to be abundant, but everything that gives joy and it can be music, it can be uh, cuddling or sexuality, it can be nature. But I think this ecstatic, Elements can transform every emotion. And when you make fear into something funny, <laughs> you know, mm. you can flip it over. When you, uh, when you, uh, somebody caresses me, you uh, gently, you can have the shivers the same as when you're afraid, but you're enjoying yourself, you know? So mm -hmm. that this, this joyful aspect it can mutate, can release the energy of that ocean and in metal music, it's anger or frustration, and you can transform it into something positive, uh, and release. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you said, the, the energy, there has to be some, yeah, it's like flipping of the, from, from negative to positive, the same bodily well, and energetic thing, but in a positive experience way. Yeah. Well, I think everything we're talking about too is about moving towards the energy, going inward, bringing a bit of observation to the experience with whatever it is. And that brings the transmission. If we get, because we can't express the energy in an over, if we're overwhelmed by it, and then that doesn't help, yeah. you know, then it's just like, we're just destructive, you know, yeah. or, um, you know, like the mosh pit, that's a, it's kind of a dangerous place, but in a sense, it's a safe place to lay out your aggression. 
I'm right. always with my eyes closed in the mosh pit. <laughs> really? I, I survived so far. Yeah, I'm just way yeah. up in the music. It's it's yeah. like, uh, yeah, kind of, uh, what do you call it? But, but if you do that, if you do that at the bus stop, you get arrested, right? If you do that in the mosh pit, you're okay. When so, I did that at the mental hospital, they threw me in the isolation cell. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, that's yeah. what I mean about a safe space. It's got to yeah. be a safe space. And sometimes you can find that in a public uh, area, uh, but usually not. Usually, usually yeah. Not. And there has to be some kind of uh, positivity in in the setting, like we were talking about the the, the safe and free space and the respectful uh, place, that, uh, sensitive to your needs, that kind of stuff. But there's also be yeah, it's a kind of positive element of of joy or or, or for instance, with hearing voices for me the question mark about what these voices are, I filled it in with uh, fearful <laughs> stuff, you know, but for me, even my recovery was tra transiting from fearful reaction to the unknown to a curiosity to the unknown, you know, then you have the same unknown, but yeah, you transform your relationship to it in a positive way. There has to be some kind of, yeah, positive, um, intent or trust um towards the situation you know then yeah. maybe it's maybe it's uh, this what you were talking about this surrender you know in the marsh pit <laughs> you have to yeah kind of surrender to the marsh pit <laughs> or, or to the cats uh, that you're caressing you know you have to yeah. get into a dead involved <laughs> let it in let it in and yeah. it was very funny because I, I watched just going back to my cat uh everything's about me of course um <laughs> Go, going back to the, the cat, you know, my wife had a thing. She didn't really want a cat around because of the hair. You know, there's a lot of hair. And But when we moved into our house, the cat was already here, living outside on the property. Hmm. And it was like eight months later that we started to give it food. And then hmm. it got closer and closer and closer to us. And then and it's a very hairy cat. Long hair, right? Long hair. Yeah, yeah. And we brought Lion. it into the... Yeah, we brought it into the veranda area. I'm going to put a photo up so people can see. Yeah. We brought it into the veranda area. But the next thing you know, after making initial contact, the cat, my, my wife is a lot smaller than me. And the cat was less intimidated by her physically. Yeah. And next thing you know, the cat is all over her legs, all over her pants, crawling yeah. up on her chair, crawling on her chest, crawling on her back. And she would come in from being outside with the cat for 15 minutes absolutely covered in cat hair i mean just like a fur <laughs> coat across her whole body yeah. and it was this like leisure you surrendered to the experience you know congratulations <laughs> you know it was like it was like a lesson she needed to learn that it was okay to be covered in cat hair you know? yeah 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 uh, and her clothes were a mess and she was good with it i mean she really came a long way you know uh, i like uh, it yeah for sure for sure well, great. This has been a really interesting conversation, really stimulating. Um, yeah, it feels thank like you. we're coming to a close. Thank you. I really uh, always have felt and now again feel really good in uh, having a dialogue with you. And uh, thank you for inviting, yeah. but also for sharing your ideas and experience so open and, and your emotions as well. So, yeah, let me stay to that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Yeah, and and thank you as well. It's it's I think it's always great to talk to people. For me, it's great to talk to people who are really, as they say in the psychiatric world, in the trenches to a certain degree. You know, you're not a university professor sort of just sort of talking about things that they don't have any experience with, you know. Yeah. You've you've been at, you were in a hospital for a year, you yeah. know. You were you were on the street you're working with people, you've healed tremendously, you know? And so I think your story is really fascinating and you're a great inspiration for a lot of people. Thank you. I know you are too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great work, man. I, we, these dialogues. Yeah. We should have more often, you know, just completely free outside of dogma and sincere. Yeah. Yeah. Just the regular conversation. All right, so we'll we'll close it out. Uh, stay on the call. All right. Yeah. Yeah. But um, thanks and to everybody. Ciao, ciao, and uh, 
Hope nobody minded me crying on my interview. <laughs> a little embarrassing, but had to be done. It's the soulful and, uh, thing to do. <laughs> yeah, and that's it for now. Okay, so see you.